<laughs> there you uh, go. Yeah. So we're going to be, I'm going to be presenting uh, this work on ForecastNet, uh, which is a data-driven high-resolution uh, uh, weather model surrogate. Um, so uh, before I get into the presentation, uh, I do want to acknowledge the team behind this work uh, that comprises of several researchers from um, uh, various institutions, uh, uh, from NVIDIA, NERSC, uh, Purdue, RICE, and Caltech. Uh, each member has had a significant contribution to this work and comes from uh, various different backgrounds and expertise uh, because this is uh, truly an interdisciplinary work. Okay. Um, uh, just to motivate um, uh, the problem a little bit, um, the challenge is probably clear to a lot of people today. There has been a dramatic rise in extreme weather events across the globe. Um, that is attributed to climate change that is happening here and today um, uh, and is amplifying the changing weather patterns. So this is a chart that shows uh, some of the extreme weather events in the summer of 2021. And we can see a lot of events like drought, heat waves, wildfires, uh, storms and hurricanes and flooding events uh, that have been occurring uh, throughout the globe. Uh, and basically, uh, there is this large need to be able to simulate global weather patterns and be able to predict the future of the atmospheric state um, in order to make um, uh, well-informed decisions. And uh, climate science has been uh, progressing in the past several decades in terms of modeling uh, very steadily, uh, whether well, uh, we're being able to model higher and higher uh, resolutions in order to uh, resolve finer scale structures. And uh, this is a figure that's uh, taken out of uh, a nature paper a few years back and adapted by NVIDIA, where uh, if you look at the current state-of-the-art model that is going to come out uh, operationally in 2023, roughly, uh, it's going to be running at a kilometer scale resolution. Um, and if you take that uh, as the sort of baseline compute and then project forward in time, um, we want to get to the 100 meter resolution in order, in order to be uh, resolving the fine scale structures of storms and hurricanes. And that would require a 10,000 X compute um, because uh, compute roughly scales as resolution to the fourth. And uh, in order to get to this uh, holy grail scale of a meter resolution, which resolves these low cloud parameterization processes, um, uh, and that actually represents the greatest uncertainty in climate models. Uh, that would require like a billion X uh, compute. Uh, and it would, uh, based on current trends, it would take uh, up to 2060 uh, to reach that resolution and by which time it, that would be too late. Uh, so the big question here is uh, today with modern supercomputers and accelerator technologies like GPUs um, and machine learning models uh, that have shown very promising trends uh, in being in computational effic efficiency, uh, and also being able to capture complex parameterizations, can these accelerated machine learning models actually help us to reach that scale um, while simultaneously uh, being able to capture the physics of the atmosphere? Um, so here, uh, I'm going to broadly be focusing on, on three main challenges. Um, so climate science requires roughly a million X speedups in general, uh, and it's challenging. Uh, so the first main challenge is model complexity. So uh, weather is a very complicated physical process. It, uh, it, is, it does comprise of a multitude of uh, physical processes across a wide range of scales from micrometers to kilometers. And this generally involves solving hundreds of nonlinear PDEs uh, and complex parameterizations uh, that have to be empirically evaluated. Um, and very related to this challenge is uh, there's a high computational cost uh, associated with solving these PDEs. Uh, we typically need higher and higher resolutions to resolve the fine scale structures. And, and what is probably more important is that uh, we do need larger ensembles of models uh, in order to quantify the model uncertainty that comes from, uh, say, the stochastic nature of these fine scale uh, physical processes or uncertainty from initial conditions or boundary conditions. And uh, this really amplifies the computational costs. So today we have orders of tens of ensembles that is run operationally, but we would need about thousands of ensembles to adequately characterize um, the distribution of possible outcomes. And this can really help us in uh, being able to quantify extreme events. Uh, and finally, related to the second challenge is the scalability and performance of such models. Uh, so current models are not designed to exploit modern supercomputing substrates, uh, GPUs, et cetera. Uh, and the uh, high performance gains that you get from a uh, lower mixed position uh, solving. 
And in general, running these models at scale constantly in order to get larger and larger ensembles just consumes a lot of energy. Um, so uh, data-driven models can help mitigate some of these challenges. Uh, so in terms of complexity, uh, data-driven surrogates can help overcome model bias and learn parameterizations directly from the data. Um, machine learning models and especially deep learning models have, have shown to be very successful uh, in learning complex mappings between input and output spaces and, and being able to learn complex parameterizations uh, uh, without any explicit feature engineering. Uh, and, and deep learning based models uh, uh, have, can successfully exploit GPU compute to yield improved performance. And in general, once trained, these models and inference are blazingly fast and can run on just orders of uh, 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 orders of one GPUs, uh, and that can really help us uh, dramatically reduce energy costs. Uh, and finally, today uh, there are a lot of optimization. Uh, there are a lot of optimized implementations uh, with really great software frameworks uh, to enable scalable AI uh, through different parallel, uh, parallelism strategies. Um, and uh, towards this end, um, uh, we introduced this model, ForecastNet, which is a scalable data-driven global weather forecasting surrogate model. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, this is the current state-of-the-art uh, deep learning-based weather emulator at a high-resolution scale. Uh, so ForecastNet is primarily data-driven uh, and shows excellent skill on important atmospheric variables, uh, especially those variables with fine-scale structures like surface wind velocities uh, or total precipitation. Um, and in fact, uh, the skill of this model uh, actually ap approaches the skill of a uh, state-of-the-art numerical weather prediction model, um, and at short time scales can also exceed the accuracy. Um, because of the nature of data-driven models, uh, operationally forecast net would run an inference, and we have about 80,000 times faster inference, and this can afford us uh, larger ensembles. Um, so essentially, larger ensembles means um, uh, better probabilistic forecasting of extreme events like hurricanes or extreme precipitation events, and that can help uh, uh, better better inform decision making for things like uh, disaster management or water or wind resource planning. Um, our implementation of ForecastNet is uh, optimized and scales to about 4,000 GPUs using uh, model-specific parallelization strategies um, that is ultimately needed to enable high-resolution exascale or beyond exascale weather and climate computing. And in this talk, I'll be talking about each of these contributions separately. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea of the data set uh, and uh, some model details, um, AI surrogate models for weather are generally trained on the EFI uh, reanalysis data set. Uh, so ELA5 comes from ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium um, for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Uh, this is like an operational research facility that gives you uh, 24 by 7 weather forecasts of important atmospheric variables. Uh, so the data is at 40 years, is for 40 years at hourly intervals for several variables uh, at a 25 kilometer grid uh, that uh, uh, roughly translates to an image that's of size 720 by 1440 pixels. So these are like some uh, example images taken at some specific uh, timestamp. Um, the top row is wind velocities in the X and Y direction. Um, this is a slower moving field that's your potential height. And uh, this is the global two meter temperature pattern. And we can immediately see that there's a lot of fine scale structures that, we, that we'll have to model really well. Um, and in general, uh, the EF5 reanalysis data set uh, uh, represents the best available estimate of the Earth's atmospheric state because uh, it, it performs a data assimilation step where it incorporates observations, uh, real observations uh, from the Earth's atmosphere into a numerical weather prediction model. Uh, and the way it works is uh, uh, this reanalysis state is taken as an initial condition that's fed into a numerical weather prediction model that essentially forward steps that in time uh, to get the future of uh, any of the atmospheric states. Uh, and what uh, we want to do is we want to replace that numerical weather prediction model with a data-driven model. So our basic strategy here is to create forecasts by recursively stepping forward in time. Um, so uh, uh, this field is pretty nascent. So as a starting point, uh, uh, most, most works use a subset of the full uh, state variable to characterize the atmospheric state. Uh, so ForecastNet uses uh, about uh, uses 21 variables that's highlighted in this table here. 
So we have variables related to uh, surface, surface wind velocities and temperature, and the same states at uh, uh, various different uh, uh, pressure levels. Uh, and also variables like total column water vapor and total precipitation that's not included in this table because um, we deal with that separately and i'll get to that in a few slides um, in the future we do look at uh, using all the variables like a uh, numerical weather prediction models uh, but it's possibly unnecessary um, uh, to use all the variables to characterize the state and maybe smart dimension dimensionality reduction techniques can help us here um, but uh, from a high level, our input vector to our model uh, is a 21 by 720 by 1440 tensor. So 21 channels represents 21 variables, and that's the uh, uh, height and width of the image. And during training, we essentially predict uh, a tensor of the same size at time t plus delta t uh, from x of t, and influence is autoregressively forward stepped in time. So uh, the output from the model is once again fed back as input and this is repeated to get more and more forecasts. Um, okay, so uh, diving into some uh, model details now, uh, and this is- hey, going Can to I ask a question about the training real quick? Yeah. Um, so so you mentioned the climate change, you know, uh, disrupting everything at the beginning is, so when you're deciding on the 40 years of data to train, is it, um, have y'all looked at, you know, training at more recent data versus the whole data set or older data and how that changes the accuracy? Yeah, I mean, we haven't looked specifically at training with recent versus all, there's definitely this climate shift that is probably uh, uh, going to affect us. But here we actually use the full 40 years for training. Uh, like, uh, I'm, like, I think we use 1979 to uh, 20, 2015, uh, 2016 to train the full model. Um, okay. But it's something where it's a it's a very good point, and we are looking at how the, there's a drift due to climate change and how that's going to affect our predictions. Um, okay, so um, so our model is uh, based on a vision transformer backbone. Uh, so uh, vision transformers are one of the state of the art networks for you know, vision tasks. Uh, that are an alternative to convolutional neural networks. Uh, and, and the way they work is uh, they have this uh, tokenization of input using a uh, patch embedding layer. So uh, if you have an image that's uh, it's first split into patches and each patch is essentially flattened and projected onto a higher dimensional space. So if you think of the tensor as C channels and height by width image that's reshaped into a sequence of size N, that's the number of patches, times uh, p square c, where p is the patch size, because uh, each patch is uh, p by p uh, image. And this essentially is embedded onto a higher dimension d uh, using a linear projection. Uh, and the main engine of a uh, transformer architecture is that these embedded patches are passed uh, through an attention mechanism um, that models the inter that models how uh, different tokens in our different patches interact with each other. And, and that uh, turns out to be a quadratic operation. So uh, uh, self-attention basically scales as order of n squared. And uh, in order to deal with this quadratic complexity, um, uh, uh, a few folks came up with the Fourier neural operators, which uh, moves this uh, uh, mixing operation, which is like the modeling the interaction between each token from the image space to the Fourier space. So that deals with the quadratic complexity by dropping it to an n log n operation. So, um, here, the spatial mixing layer is the tensor is passed to an FFT, uh, and then the frequencies are multiplied using a kernel, and then there's an IFFT that comes out uh, back to the image space. And this operation is essentially a global convolution because uh, convolution in image space is multiplication in the Fourier space. Um, and uh, without going into too many details, um, so Weber et al. came up with adaptive Fourier neural operators, the CR and ICLR. Um, and I do invite you to check out that paper for more details, but from a high level, they wanted to control the complexity of the operations further. And so they introduced like a block diagonal structure um, on the channel mixing weights that's in the frequency domain. So essentially a D by D kernel is now uh, split into uh, K blocks uh, of size D by K by D by K. And um, uh, the weights are also shared across every single input token, and that drastically reduces the parameter count. 
Um, and finally, uh, since images are inherently sparse uh, in the Fourier domain and all the energy is uh, usually concentrated on low frequencies, uh, they introduce a sparse bio um, and the resulting uh, L1 minimization can be solved using a soft thresholding operator. Um, so the forecast net architecture is just stacked AFNO blocks from the previous slide. So we have an input uh, uh, that goes to the embedding and goes to the spatial mixing that happens in the Fourier space. And then there's also this channel mixing layer that comes out, which essentially just mixes uh, the inputs in the channel dimension. And that's just a multi-layer perceptron uh, uh, that goes through a linear decoder that reshapes it back into a tensor of the same uh, shape as the input at time t plus delta t. So, um, we train on full high resolution inputs, and the training is from on the years 1979 to 2015. Um, uh, we use the full data set for training, and validation is on uh, 2016 and 2017 for hyperparameter tuning and getting the best model configuration. Uh, for testing, we test on all the years uh, from 2018. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the data set size, it's about five terabytes. And we have approximately uh, 50,000 images that uh, 50,000 samples that need to get through uh, in a training uh, in a training iteration. Um, uh, just to get into some operational aspects of the model, uh, so the model is pre-trained and fine-tuned. So in a pre-training step, uh, it's exactly what I explained before, where you have an input time t to predict output t plus delta t, and this model is uh, further fine-tuned, uh, where at time t, or in this case k, it's passed to the model to get time k plus one, and then there's a loss computed at this time step, and that output is again passed to the model to get a time k plus two, and a new loss is computed, and the total loss is the uh, sum of these two losses, and the gradients are fully backpropagated. And the fine-tuning step is essentially to increase accuracy, and we did find that it has nice uh, stability characteristics. Um, so we do treat total precipitation as a, as a diagnostic variable and don't include it in the original uh, list of variables uh, because this is typically what's done um, due to the fact that this variable is extremely challenging to predict. It has highly sparse features and a distribution that's very different from the other variables. And in general, it doesn't, it doesn't affect uh, the evolution of like the, the other prognostic variables. So. Uh, so for precipitation, we train a separate model that's completely diagnostic, where we have a backbone model uh, that's trained using the pre-training plus fine-tuning steps. Uh, this is for all the prognostic uh, 20 channels. Uh, and once that's trained, uh, the model has frozen parameters and detached gradients. Um, and the precipitation model, which has the same architecture, uh, takes the output of the AFNO as input and, and then predicts the total precipitation at the same time step. Uh, and this essentially uh, um, uh, decouples the modeling difficulty of modeling precipitation from uh, this uh, general task of forecasting uh, the prognostic variables. Um, and in general, uh, we don't really need to have an AFNO backbone. This could be any model uh, because this model is purely diagnostic and that makes this an attractive option. Um, Finally, as I said before, inference is autoregressive. So the outputs are fed back as inputs uh, to get the next time step. And at each time step, the, uh, the precipitation is diagnosed from the outputs of the uh, uh, AFNO uh, architecture. Um, okay, so getting into some uh, results now. Uh, so uh, ForecastNet shows excellent skill in predicting surface, uh, surface wind velocities. So here in this figure, uh, we are visualizing the spatial temporal pattern uh, of uh, the wind velocities um, uh, near the surface. Um, so this is the initial condition that comes from the ELA5 data set. And this is the prediction from forecast net at 96 hours lead time. It's uh, four days, and this is the ground load. Uh, and there are a few interesting things uh, uh, that we want to note here. So if you focus on inset one that's zoomed in in this region, we can see that uh, in, in a matter of four days, there is this uh, super typhoon that's forming and moving towards the coast of uh, China. Uh, and we do observe that um, our model is able to capture the rapid intensification of this uh, uh, really well compared to the uh, ground truth. And on the other side of the globe, um, 
there are three hurricanes uh, uh, forming as Florence, uh, Isaac, and Helene uh, that are heading towards the eastern coast of the United States. And once again, you observe that um, uh, a forecast net is able to capture the formation and uh, trajectory of these hurricanes pretty well. Um, Quantitatively speaking, uh, our accuracy metrics are ACC, that's the um, anomaly correlation coefficient, and RMSC, that's the root mean squared error. Um, uh, and we observe that uh, our metrics are comparable to the operational IFS model at uh, this resolution. So here, the red curve denotes um, the model prediction, the, the ACC and RMSC value from forecast net. Uh, whereas the blue is from the IFS, and, and we see that uh, our values are, are really compatible. And I will get to that uh, for the other variables in a few slides. Um, related to the previous slide, uh, we are able to predict hurricane paths and intensities quite well. So uh, this is uh, the track of Hurricane Michael uh, that had devastating impacts in, uh, in places like Florida in 2018. Um, so the blue track here represents the ground truth over four days uh, of the hurricane, and the red here is the predicted hurricane track from our model. Um, the uh, the red circles around is the uncertainty cone that we get from uh, getting different ensembles ensemble predictions by perturbing the initial condition with uh, Gaussian random noise. And we observe that the true trajectory uh, is uh, within the cone of uncertainty. Uh, and we also observe that once again, it's able to predict the intensification of the hurricane pretty well. So these are at surface wind speeds and wind speeds at a different level uh, up, to, uh, up to three days. And you see that compared to the ground truth, our model is able to predict the intensification of the hurricane pretty well. Um, we do have a gap to close in terms of the intensity of this. Um, and that's uh, probably because um, we're still not at a resolution that can capture uh, fine scale structures of storms uh, well, but we are hopeful that as we go to higher resolution, we're able to close this gap. Um, another important thing is that uh, we can capture near uh, uh, surface wind predictions over land uh, pretty well. Um, this has important implications to things like uh, wind resource planning for wind farms. Uh, this is in general a harder field to predict because of different uh, orographic features over land, but um, as we can see, um, compared to the ground truth, we are able to capture some of these high wind speed patterns uh, over the United States uh, pretty well. Uh, so coming to uh, precipitation, uh, this is uh, one of the most challenging fields to predict in weather forecasting. Um, uh, we do show a pretty good skill compared to IFS on this variable too. So this is once again, the spatial temporal prediction. That's the initial condition and the predicted value at 36 hours. And this is the ground truth from uh, the daily analysis data set. Um, so um, while we do miss some of the really fine scale features, uh, we still see good performance if you focus on uh, specific insects here. So uh, in inset one, there is a high precipitation event that's happening because an atmospheric river is making landfall uh, over the western coast of the United States. And we do see that our model is able to capture that uh, really well. And we also, uh, and somewhere near the coast of the United Kingdom is an extra tropical um, cyclone that's creating, creating another extreme precipitation event. And once again, the, the, the uh, predicted uh, fields is uh, remarkably close to the ground though. In terms of ACC and RMSC values, uh, up to 48 hours, um, the model does have higher ACC uh, than the IFS and it's in general compatible. Um, the values do decay pretty quick because in general, precipitation is uh, easily one of the hardest fields to predict. Um, and one of the reasons why we do well on total precipitation is because we do have moisture variable dynamics uh, that are captured well in our backbone model. So this is uh, one of those fields. Um, uh, this is just a video over uh, 96 hours. The top row is forecast net predictions and the bottom is the, the ground truth. And this is just a zoomed in region uh, of the atmospheric river that's making landfall uh, near Northern California. And predicting such events can really be crucial to things like um, uh, water resource planning because extreme precipitation events happen due to uh, atmospheric rivers making landfall. Um, 
So looking at other variables, we do see good short-term ACC and RMAC metrics that are uh, really close to IFS uh, on all the channels. Um, so just to go into some details, what these plots are showing you is ACC or RMSC over uh, several initial conditions taken over the span of an entire year um, uh, from our testing data set. Um, so the, the solid line represents the mean ACC or RMSC value and the spread of values is quantified by the 25th uh, or the 75th percentile. Um, there is a really important caveat here in that these values are computed using the either five data set as ground truth, and that's a reanalysis data set. Uh, well, ideally, you would want to com compare directly with observations, uh, but that is something that we're working on and hope to include into our toolkit. Um, but the key takeaway from this slide is that uh, this is the first time that uh, a deep learning based data driven model at this scale is able to uh, reach comparable accuracy uh, to an actual numerical weather prediction model. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit on extremes. Uh, so extreme events are really, uh, it's really important to predict this uh, well. Uh, we do see good performance up to about 90 percentile uh, extremes, but after that, our model does start to lag. So for example, in total precipitation, uh, if you go beyond the 98 percentile, uh, we do see that forecast net lags behind the IFS that also lags behind the actual ground truth. Another way to visualize this is to plot the relative quantile error, which is the error between uh, the top quantiles between the ground truth um, and the predicted uh, and the predicted field. And uh, once again, we do see that we, we we are lagging behind IFS on extremes. Uh, the story is not the same for all variables. We do uh, do better on variables like uh, surface wind velocities, uh, but. Um, this is another focus on being able to get these fine scale structures that can be really important uh, to get extreme events. Um, finally, for the sake of uh, uh, completeness, we do compare against what was uh, the state of the art model before forecast net. Um, so uh, it is a model from Jonathan Rain and collaborators at Microsoft Research. Uh, it's called DLWP. Uh, so that model. So forecast net models far more variables than DLWP and thus operate at uh, eight times finer resolution in both in both latitude and longitude dimensions. Uh, but for the sake of comparison, uh, we downsample our prediction uh, and then compute ACC and RMC values uh, for two fields that uh, both our models predict. So here, uh, the black line is the ACC or RMC value from DLWP. And as before, the red is from forecast net and IFS is um, the blue line. And, and we do see that we have a much higher scale on weather time scales. Uh, an important note is that DLWP can actually do well even on uh, longer time scales, uh, whereas forecast net currently shows good performance up to about two weeks. Um, but in principle, we can combine the two models so that we can get good performance on, on both time scales. Um, okay, so um, moving into some of the computational aspects, which is the second uh, uh, second part of the talk. Uh, forecast net is uh, faster and, and more energy efficient than numerical weather prediction models. Uh, so in this table, we are summarizing uh, the latency and the energy consumption for a 24-hour 100-member ensemble forecast. Um, so. Um, there's a caveat here in that IFS actually runs at 18 kilometer resolution, which is higher resolution than forecast net. So since we're just doing timings here, we just uh, interpolate our images to higher resolution and then run it in inference. Um, so first thing is that the IFS needs about 3000 nodes uh, to do this computation, whereas we need uh, you know, two nodes uh, and inference time uh, for forecast net. So that, that represents about a 1500 times lesser compute resource requirement during inference. Um, uh, to compute latency, we use node seconds, which is how much time it would take if we just had like a single node. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, it is about 45,000 time, uh, 45, times faster uh, than a numerical model. Uh, and in terms of energy consumed, we're about 12,000 times uh, smaller energy footprint. Um, but uh, there are actually several caveats here that we want to make note of. 
first is forecast net is not physics constrained. Um, it is really important to have physically consistent solutions because well, when you want to extrapolate forward in time, we don't want to be making, you know, we don't want to be making unphysical um, uh, predictions. Uh, however, there's a wealth of um, research that's happening on how to introduce physics constraints into deep learning models. Uh, and that is uh, uh, something that uh, we're looking at moving forward. We do have pure variables and levels in IFS, uh, but what's probably the most important is that at the moment, uh, this model cannot perform or does not perform data assimilation with, obs uh, with observations and, and is reliant on IFS uh, or models like the IFS for initial condition. Um, so we would like to go to higher and higher resolutions uh, in order to resolve more fine scale structures and in general, see how we, how we do um, in getting the extremes. But um, as we go to higher resolutions, there are a lot of scaling challenges that exist. Um, so in terms of the model, the main computational engines are uh, FFTs and, and dense matrix uh, multiplies. So currently we are at a 25 kilometer resolution. Um, sequence length is about a million. That's essentially 720 by uh, 1440. And you would have to perform uh, D FFTs in every, in every block. So D once again is the embedding dimension. And that's typically about uh, 1024 or uh, 2048. Um, moving to higher resolutions, the image size would become uh, uh, 3600 by 7200. And eventually at the larger scale, 18,000 by 36,000 uh, is gonna be the image dimension. Um, so we would really need to have uh, distributed FFTs uh, to tackle this problem. Uh, but there's a lot of work happening today uh, in QFFT to get, uh, um, to get efficient distributed FFTs um, to scale out to multiple nodes. So uh, this is uh, a challenge that we can definitely tackle. Um, we have dense matrix multiplies. Uh, this is specifically in the channel mixing layer in the, uh, in the input space. Um, so those matrix, matrices look like 4D by D times D class N, uh, but once again, D is the embedding dimension. Uh, and in general, as you go to higher and higher resolution, uh, not only does the compute uh, go really high, but our memory footprint also increases. So even at intermediate resolutions, just by extrapolating from how much memory we're using now and how much we would need at this resolution, we would need hundreds of gigabytes uh, uh, to train our model. And at the highest resolution, um, our, mo our memory complexity is gonna be in order of terabytes. Uh, finally, we are now going from one time step to just the next time step, but we could in principle have a history of uh, time steps and increasing that temporal resolution once again uh, increases the scaling challenges. Um, the big point here is that as we move forward, we would have to think of uh, different parallelization strategies. Uh, so today, um, um, so I mean, before that, I want to talk about what what parallelization strategies exist for uh, for deep learning models. Um, so the most standard thing is uh, data parallelism, where um, we have a batch of images that's passed into the model, and the batch, the global batch, is now split across different processors uh, or GPUs in this case. And essentially every processor, every processor has a copy of the model weights, does its computations independently. And uh, only when you're updating the weights, uh, um, uh, is there an all reduced operation to get uh, the latest gradients onto every single processor. Um, but as we move to higher scales, uh, data parallelism is not sufficient. Um, uh, models don't fit on uh, a single GPU anymore, and we would have to think about different model parallelism strategies. Um, so the easiest thing we can think about is uh, feature parallelism, where we are now splitting the channel dimension, uh, which is either the embedding dimension or the hidden size uh, within the channel mixing MLPs. Uh, so that is split into different GPUs, and these dense layer operations now become distributed matrix, uh, matrix matrix multiplies. So for instance, the hidden size is distributed. We're now looking at uh, like a row parallel matrix multiply in the forward pass, uh, and it's a different operation in the backward pass. And I'll get to that soon. Um, moving to higher resolution also means that images become larger and larger, and we would have to think about spatial parallelism, which is essentially just domain decomposition, where we split the height and width of the image um, into uh, into different uh, GPUs. 
uh, and essentially the FFTs uh, become uh, distributed FFTs now. Uh, so the communication pattern is like an all to all transpose, and we'll have to think about things like exchanging statistics for layer norms. Okay, so in our current implementation, we, we employ a hybrid parallelism that's, uh, uh, that's feature parallelism and data parallelism. So uh, as I explained, feature parallelism means for us, we are splitting the channel dimension into different, uh, under different GPUs. So if you think about the spatial mixing layer, uh, each FFT that's on, uh, on a separate GPU can now operate independently of the other FFTs. And this, then this becomes an embarrassingly parallel operation. But when you think about the channel mixing MLPs that is actually mi mixing uh, the inputs in, in the feature dimension, uh, we split the hidden dimension across GPUs. Uh, and this requires uh, different communication patterns, whether whether it's in a forward pass or a backward pass. Um, and essentially, since uh, we're doing this uh, multiple times uh, because there are twelve blocks, uh, twelve AF node blocks uh, within the forecast net architecture, uh, there are a few things uh, that we do to make sure we get good performance. So uh, we do model parallelism across GPUs only within a single node. And we refer to all the GPUs uh, uh, where the weights are split as, as a model instance. So for instance, on full model, if you have four GPUs on a single node, um, at most, you would have a, a four-way model parallelism. And those four GPUs would uh, comprise a single model instance. Um, and this is done so that we can exploit the uh, uh, low latency, high bandwidth, and we link interconnect between them. Uh, and uh, the data parallelism now happens across different model instances. So now we have to be careful about gradient reduction. So uh, reducing gradients uh, needs to happen only across model instances and not across uh, every single uh, parameter. So what that means is for any model parallel rank K, we would have to keep track of the matching rank in a different model instance. Uh, and then do a uh, gradient reduction only across those uh, ranks. Um, so for instance, here, if you have four-way model parallelism on four model on a single node, then the data parallelism, uh, data parallel units would be uh, single, single node units. Um, from an implementation point of view, uh, we do that uh, by employing independent communicators for the model parallel and data parallel regimes. Okay, so, Getting into uh, some a little bit more detail. Uh, so in the channel mixing MLPs in the input space, uh, we would need to think about how the forward and backward pass work. So operations need different communication patterns in forward and backward passes. So for instance, a row parallel matrix multiply will not have uh, communication in the forward pass, but the backward pass where we're now computing uh, uh, its transpose matrix multiply with, with a gradient, uh, that would require an all reduce operation. So this is like an example code snippet uh, of the MLP uh, uh, from our model. So here, uh, our hidden dimension for the MLP is uh, typically four times the channels. So we split that into different GPUs. Uh, and so the input gets in, uh, the, the first function does nothing in the forward pass, it just copies the, copies the tensor. And then, uh, and then the matrix multiply is computed using um, a convolution. So this is just a uh, slide one, kernel one convolution that just uh, implements a matrix multiply. Um, and then we go through, uh, and when we want to get back from the hidden dimension back into our channel dimension, uh, this is now a column parallel matrix multiply. And so we would have to have an all reduce operation. Uh, and then finally we return the tensor. But when we're doing the backward pass, we'll have to be careful because when you're going back, uh, this operation will just pass the tensor uh, through because it's a row parallel matrix multiply. But when we come all the way to the top, uh, we would have to implement null reduce because now that is a column parallel matrix multiply. Uh, so the way that's done is we have custom other grad functions that just uh, over, override the forward or backward pass depending on, uh, depending on what the function is. Um, so the spectral convolutions are an important part, but these are embarrassingly parallel, as I explained. Uh, there is no specialized PyTorch layer. Uh, we just use uh, uh, real-to-complex and complex-to-real-torch FFT functions. 
Um, so FFTs, uh, the channels are split across different um, GPUs. So each FFTs can operate in a completely disjoint fashion. Um, there's also this block diagonal uh, matrix multiplied for the mixing in the frequency space in the channel dimension. Uh, so each block here is once again distributed to different GPUs. So uh, you can think of this cartoon uh, that shows how it's done. And each block kernel uh, has a matrix multiply that's disjoint from the others. And so this is also an embarrassingly parallel operation. Um, okay, so going into some tricks that we had to use to get uh, better performance. Um, we use NVIDIA uh, DALI for I.O. operations uh, in order to ensure efficient uh, I.O. that runs uh, concurrent to GPU computation and also to make sure that the pre-processing steps that for us is normalization of the images and adding noise and stability that those take place on the GPU. So DALI is an open source framework um, uh, that uh, is it's, it that actually is pretty flexible to turn on different file types. So we use HDFI here, which is a pretty common file type for scientific applications. Um, it does allow you to um, uh, create your own pipelines and write your own custom operations. Uh, and uh, it, it is pretty useful in overlapping IO with GPU computations. Um, uh, secondly, um, something that really affected our model parallel scaling was uh, too much interference from the CPU uh, because we also had this orthogonal data parallel scaling that's happening. Um, so since CPU determines what kernels to launch next, uh, we do find that sometimes because of context switches, uh, it can stall the GPU execution. Uh, CUDA graphs are a common way to take the CPU uh, out of the loop as much as possible. So these graphs, they record a sequence of kernel launches and then uh, you replay it as often as needed. And our graphs are static because uh, in training, it's essentially the same option, the same operation uh, that's happening again and again. Um, so we record the full training process, the forward and backward pass um, as a graph. Uh, we don't do it for IO or validation uh, because we, 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 uh, we observe that it doesn't really cause a lot of performance uh, drops. Um, so metrics like uh, ACC computation or MSC computation or certain uh, model specific operations are, are a bunch of mathematical operations. Uh, these are all lightweight uh, ops, um, but each of them generates a separate kernel call. Uh, so we just use uh, uh, dodge.jit.script uh, to get a script function uh, to fuse all these uh, operations into larger kernels to reduce launch latency. Um, finally, uh, we use NVIDIA Insight uh, compute to uh, measure our pulling point operations uh, per second. So we have a script that gives, gives, gives us a list of uh, flops generating instructions that are each multiplied by uh, specific weighting factors, like one for multiplier or, or, or add. Um, use multiplier and add has a, a weight of two. Uh, tensor operations have higher weights, et cetera. And what's done is um, uh, we compute this on a single GPU multiplied with number of GPUs because our model is perfectly load balanced. Uh, and that's also multiplied by number of iterations and averaged over all the epochs to get like a median uh, flops to get sustained flop rate and, and a max value that gives us the peak performance. Uh, okay, so um, just to get quickly get into some scaling results. Uh, so our model scales to about um, 3,808 GPUs uh, on, on full model with a peak performance of 141, uh, 140.8 uh, petaflops per second. Uh, so we did scaling runs on three different supercomputers, uh, Jules Booster at Ulex Supercomputing Facility, uh, full model at NERSC and Selene at NVIDIA. And here we're measuring on the y-axis uh, the peak uh, um, flops per second rate and the x-axis the number of GPUs. And uh, the different colors represent uh, different model parallel instance sizes. So instance size four means that model parallelism is across four GPUs. Um, we observe really good scaling for Perl model and Selene all the way to uh, almost 3,000 GPUs. Whereas Jules Brewster tapers off at about uh, 1024 GPUs, uh, possibly due to some file system uh, uh, performance drops. Um, in terms of data parallel scaling, we do really well. So 
to think of going from two to the seven to two to the eight GPUs uh, and focus on a single model parallel instance that effectively uh, uh, boils down to doubling the batch size. And so uh, we can see that the scaling is uh, really good across in all systems. Um, however, the balance between model and data parallelism is pretty different and we do observe uh, system dependent performance. So for instance, on Perl model and Jules, it, it is, we, we observe that uh, model instance size four performs better than two. Uh, for example, if you focus on instance size two, uh, with two to the seven GPUs, if I want to scale to two to the eight GPUs, uh, I can do that as a data parallel scaling by doubling the batch size, the global batch size, or I can uh, keep that the same and increase the model parallelism to instance size four. And we observed that uh, uh, model parallelism of four has better performance than two. Uh, the same is for Paul model, but the story is reversed in Celine, where you want to go, for example, from two to seven to two to eight again. Uh, it's uh, the instance size four and eight actually do worse than instance size two. So there is a higher performance gain uh, when data parallelism is increased on Celine, uh, whereas it's the opposite for Paul model and Jules. Uh, and this is because um, uh, Celine has, uh, this is probably because Celine has uh, balanced into a node and into a node bandwidth and uses like hybrid uh, NV link or infinity band uh, algorithms and hence does not suffer as much from large scale collectives. So uh, if you are on Perl model or Jules, it is better to focus on increasing local communication, whereas in Celine, it's probably good to scale out the, the global communication. Um, Another way to think about this is that uh, larger resources enable shorter training times. So we're plotting the validation loss as a function of time here. So it would take 40 hours to train a batch size 32 model with no uh, model parallelism, but just scaling out with data parallelism to batch size 512, uh, we can get to about two and a half hours training time. And if you continue scaling both model parallelism and data parallelism, uh, we can uh, finish training in about six to seven minutes at the highest scale. Um, there is a caveat here in that hyperparameters were tuned only at uh, a single scale and then extrapolated, but in principle, models can be fine-tuned uh, to get best performance at uh, higher scales too. Um, and the bigger uh, message here is that uh, faster time distributions uh, can be afforded with greater parallelism, and that allows us to explore the space uh, of hyperparameters tuning uh, uh, much faster. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I would want to quickly conclude this talk. Uh, so this is just our contribution slides flashed again. Uh, so I talked about three main challenges and uh, uh, some of our contributions to uh, overcome them. Uh, so ForecastNet is fully data driven, uh, shows really good skill comparable to uh, the IFS on important variables. Uh, from a computational point of view, uh, uh, it, it just takes a matter of seconds to run inference uh, using a data-driven model like ForecastNet, and that uh, allows us to run larger ensembles. Uh, and finally, um, I talked a little bit about hybrid model and data, parallel, data parallelism strategies uh, to help scale out uh, ForecastNet to about 4,000 GPUs. Uh, and moving forward, we are thinking about you know, also things like spatial parallelism, uh, our pipeline parallelism that I didn't talk about today in interest of time. And this is ultimately needed uh, to enable this exascale uh, weather and climate computing. Um, so our main contribution here is that this is the current state of the art deep learning based, based weather model that is a scalable data-driven uh, uh, weather model surrogate um, uh, that enables interactivity at scale. And because of the uh, uh, computational gains, we can now uh, simulate a wider variety or diversity of scenarios uh, that can em enable better decision making. Um, so looking ahead, here are some of the things that we're working on. It's a long road. Uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, to be overcome, uh, uh, but we are uh, pretty excited uh, with what results we have uh, currently. So we're now working on higher resolutions. We're looking at a nine kilometer data set. Uh, we are looking to incorporate the full state vector, and this helps us uh, add physics constraints to our model um, in order to uh, get physically consistent solutions. Uh, something that's uh, extremely important that we haven't looked at yet is observational data. Um, we need to see how a model actually performs with observations, 
uh, introduce diagnostics uh, that show a performance here. Um, and finally, some of the other things are like uh, better ensembling strategies. This is also a pretty new area of research. Uh, and currently, ForecastNet is at weather time scales. Uh, we would want to also move to climate scales. Uh, and what's really very closely related to observational data is data simulation. So we are reliant on models like numerical weather prediction models right now for initial conditions, but uh, we hope that in the future, uh, such models can also be introduced into the data assimilation pipeline. Um, so with that, um, uh, I would like to uh, thank everybody for their attention. Um, I do invite you to check out uh, the preprint we have online um, uh, uh, regarding this model. Uh, the scaling ones were submitted to Gordon Bell, but due to embargo policies, we don't have it up yet, but we hope to have, have that up, to, uh, up soon. And um, we're also hoping to open source the code in the next couple of weeks. There are some legal technicalities uh, that we have to get over. Uh, I'm also very thankful to all the supercomputing facilities, especially all the folks at um, uh, at NERSC uh, that helped helped us with our reservations uh, during Gone Bell. Um, so uh, thanks again uh, very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to answer. Sorry, I think I went a little bit a little bit over time. Thanks. No problem. That was that was really excellent. Thanks, Shashank. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. So there's been some questions sitting in chat, so I guess we can address those first. But uh, also, if you've got further ones, just feel free to raise your hand or drop one in chat. Um, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can go over uh, how much of a time. Uh, so what do you mean by mixing? Oh, I just mean um, it's like a weight vector that learns how each input input token uh, interacts with each other. So that's all. It, it's called mixing in general in neural network uh, literature. Um, what was the motivation for choosing AFNL architecture? Um, OK, so um, this is actually a really good question. Um, there are a lot of reasons to, there were really intuitive reasons to use this architecture. So it's based on the vision transformer. So that is the state of the art uh, model in, for vision tasks. And the Fourier neural operator has shown a lot of success in simulating differential equations, essentially learning continuous uh, mappings from input to output space. So it did make sense to use uh, the FNO architecture, which combines both because uh, this is an, a vision task, but um, underlying these images is a continuous representation uh, of the atmospheric flow. Um, we did have preliminary experiments where we ran, like let's say, UNETs or ResNets, where it just gave worse performance. Um, so, and that's why we continued with the with the FNO architecture. There are other architectures online uh, because before this, there was a state of the art model which was a ResNet, which had which had like no downsampling, but none of these approaches are also scalable. So, from a practical point of view, using FNO means uh, computational engines are FFTs and matrix multiplies, and uh, there are like a lot of optimized libraries to help uh, scale out this model too. So I hope that sort of pseudo answers the question. Um, is the MLP part of the FNO? Uh, yes. So there is a spatial mixing, which means we're mixing stuff in the spatial dimension, but that's implemented as a global convolution that happens in the Fourier space. But then after that, there's also a channel mixing, which means we're seeing how the channels interact with each other. And that's done by an MLP. And this is like a common architecture choice for uh, these things called mixer models in neural networks. Um, do you find that grid projection impacts the accuracy? Um, we haven't looked at that yet. Uh, so uh, you are right that uh, this is, uh, we are now looking at a, a tangled projection of our, uh, of our inputs, which actually lie on a sphere. Uh, and we did this mainly for computational reasons. It is just more efficient to do FFTs. Um, however, uh, this is actually something we are looking at right now. Uh, what happens if we, if we do spherical harmonics? Um, uh, we, we fully expect that we would lose a lot of the performance, but if it actually gives us a lot of accuracy gains, then 
it is something that's uh, worthwhile to look at. Um, what do you mean by physics constraints? Uh, oh, so uh, this model is fully data driven. So it, it takes inputs as data um, and then learns to map it to an output space. That's the data at a, at a, a different time step. But um, all weather models have differential equations that describe the underlying physics. Uh, this start off as mass and energy, mass momentum and energy conservation, and also like hundreds of parameterizations of different physical processes. So it's really important to also include that into our models because uh, neural networks are great at interpolating between data points, but they, one of the big challenge of using deep learning is how do they do when you're extrapolating in time? Um, and we really want to have robust and interpretable models. So adding constraints, uh, physics constraints means that you take these differential operators and add them as uh, soft penalties to the loss function so that the model that you're learning also in some sense um, uh, conforms to the physics of the underlying atmospheric flow. Um, there's a lot of work on this. Um, it's, uh, it's unclear if how they work on real systems like weather uh, which is a very high high resolution and high dimensionality system, but moving forward, I think uh, we are very interested in seeing how how uh, how much gains we can get by introducing these uh, physical laws as constraints. Um, I guess there are more uh, questions, but uh, should I just keep going? It's it's already past the hour. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, there's only two left. Might as well just answer them. Yeah, yeah, if anyone so, wants to stick around to hear them, they're, they're yeah, welcome sure. to. Um, extreme events are rare and challenging to models. Uh, uh, challenging model, do you have any plans to predict these more accurately? Um, well, we are doing several things. <laughs> um, so first is obviously going to higher resolutions to resolve the scales of extreme events like storms. Um, having better ensembles means that we are now capturing the tail end of the uh, PDF more accurately. And then, so that could help us uh, in capturing extreme events uh, better. We are looking at, uh, so a lot of these extreme events like precipitation comes from really fine scale structures. So we are also looking at generative models um, uh, with Peter and uh, a few interns uh, to see if they can actually help in A, getting better fine scale structures, but also generative models inherently uh, model the probability distribution of the data uh, conditional on the input. So they could in principle give us uh, better ensembles too. Um, these are all works in the pipeline. Um, but like I said, uh, this field is pretty nascent and uh, there's a lot of stuff to be done. Um, and I hope that that sort of answers the question. Um, it, what's the throughput bottleneck? Is it communication bound? Um, yeah, yeah. So a major computation here is FFTs. And as we scale out, it is going to be a, the biggest um, uh, drop in performance is going to be due to communication. Um, even now for MLPs and stuff, uh, we restrict the model parallelism to a single node because as soon as we go across multiple nodes, uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, performance drops. Um, so, but, but we're still working on seeing how, how, it, how it's actually gonna do in practice. Um, is that? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I guess I got to, hopefully I was able to answer at least in some sense, uh, most of the questions, but uh, Peter and I uh, are both uh, a part of this project and we're around uh, feel free to uh, reach out to us in Slack or email, and we would be happy to uh, answer any more questions. Um, uh, thank you so much once again for all your attention. Thanks.